Welcome to We Were Gamers episode... Episode what, Andrew? You don't know what number it is? <laughs> it's the first one I can legitimately not number, JJ. Uh-oh. Why Why is that? Because we're going to call this one In the Can. That's right. This is live to tape, which may or may not actually be a phrase, but this is uh, pre-recorded. Uh, you know, I kind of love old film phrases that don't mean anything anymore. In the can. No one has anything in the can. On the hard drive. Yeah. I, I was carrying this hard drive around. <laughs> the car that it was in got caught on fire and all the film burned. Wait, no. That's not. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so uh, we're changing it from in the can to on the drive. You heard it here first. Yeah, man. Uh, two very wise women. Both told us we should probably record an extra episode given I may have to take a, a week off here at JJ pretty pretty shortly. So we're not going to try and do too much dating. We thought we'd do like a special episode. Yeah. Yeah. A a quick, uh, a, a, I don't know if it's going to be quick, but it will be a discussion uh, about a topic like we've done before, but uh, not pre-planned, just uh, out there. Can I do a quick video game thing before we start this other thing that's not video games? Okay. Since it doesn't kind of matter at all timing wise to mention this, I did pick up my 3DS to play a game that we'll talk about later. Uh, and I, I noticed I had a bunch of street passes still. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is kind of like a weird. A long time ago, I said I was only going to play one game at a time. Right. Well, I've got like 66 street passes sitting there. And oh, I'm not man. going to a convention until Comic Con. So. I'm playing more than one game at a time now because I can just sit there. Because you got the time, right? Yeah. Today, you know what? Today I'll use my 10 street passes to do the cooking game. And tomorrow nice I'll do the stock game. And th You know? Yeah. So, again, my entire philosophy of 3DS street pass has changed. I think that will be interesting to see how that goes uh, when Comic-Con comes around again. Yeah, because you can fill up 100 in a day. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. All right, well, now we've dated it. It's pre-Comic-Con. Well, I think that it's safe to say that that will probably be some time when it will go up, so. <laughs> All right, fill people in on our topic for today. So, uh, Andrew and I were uh, discussing movies recently, uh, as we sometimes do, just sort of like talking about them a little bit, uh, and we got on the topic uh, somehow of remakes, and you know, like, there have been... Uh, I, I'm sure you do know. Uh, I'm sure the listeners out there know too. There have been a good number of these movies being remade. Uh, you know, classics sometimes get a more modern take, but sometimes even movies that aren't that old seem to get remakes like five or ten years later, just like, eh, we felt like doing this one again for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really seems like a topic that like merits some discussion, and there definitely have been times it has been done well. Uh, and not so well. Uh, so I think we each picked uh, a good remake and a bad remake. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about them here a little bit. Yeah, kind of. I think the framing our discussion about remakes was really helpful when we were starting to talk about them. And we're like, well, what about this one? What about that? It's natural to use what's been made to talk about this stuff rather than like just in some sort of ethereal space, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, ideas don't come out of nowhere, right? Everything is influenced by something. <laughs> and, 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 you know, some of the, some remakes are done a lot more literally, right? Where they just take, like, we're going to take this script shot for shot and do it again. And right, I won't say uh, one way or another whether those are often good or bad, but it, the quality is certainly variable sometimes. Uh and that just intrigued me because, like, a lot of the times, it, you know, people talk about how, like, oh, there are no new ideas in Hollywood or whatever. And that's not true, right? Like, patently, I think anyone can say there's, you know, there's new things coming out of movies. I think uh, that there's been some sort of phrasing about that. Basically, I in my English classes in college and all this sort of stuff, people, you know, jokingly say... There's no been no new ideas since Shakespeare, and it's kind of ironic in a way to say that. But yeah, sure, you can twist anything to say that it's related to something else. You got to kind of take a work of art as a whole. Hollywood is business, and 
they say, hey, this made money. Let's make it again or make something like it again. And Right. But that's a business side of it. And you have to kind of decide if sometimes the art side of it takes over. And even if the idea is similar, it's different. Exactly. And so it's not like, you know, they are literally putting together the same exact movie again. Even if you just remake a movie shot for shot, it's still new, right? There's different actors, potentially different scenes, different director, different people involved in the production. So it's not the same no matter what you do. Uh, and I just thought we would talk about some uh, some of those, uh, both good and bad, uh, to give like a little sort of example of what we're talking about. I actually did a little bit of self-examining while I was doing this. I definitely had to do research. I'm not going to lie. I could not think of enough. Oh, so, okay. So you and I had the same, maybe the same problem. I could think of plenty of good remakes, which is exactly the opposite yes. problem that I thought I was going to have. I thought yes. I was going to think of plenty of bad remakes. Yes. And all I could think of was like, this is good. This is good. This is good. And you know what I thought? I sort of self-corrected before seeing the movies saying, Yep. That's going to be bad. I'm not going to watch that. Exactly. I, I was like thinking about it. I was like, a lot of these cases, I was like, you know, doing research online, what ones had been remade and all these sort of ones. And I was like, oh, I see what happened here. I just never went to the bad ones. I just stopped going. The remake, it being a remake of a movie maybe that I liked wasn't enough to get me out there to see it. That's the issue. I think I got saved uh, and came up with a bad one because planes. Mm-hmm. Planes offer you an opportunity to say, well, might as well try it. <laughs> sure. Even though you really shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm interested to hear what that is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's easier for us to do the good ones first because we'll talk more about the good ones than the bad ones because the right. bad ones are just going to kind of be, eh, yeah, this was pretty bad and this is why I think it's bad. I think in a lot of cases, comparing the bad ones to the original can be instructive as to, like, why it wasn't good. But there's not a lot to say other than, like, yo, they didn't do a good job sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's start on the good side uh, before we get to tear down some maybe not so great ones. All right. I'm going to go first. Let's hear it. I picked, and it was a toss-up because I thought these were – they both came out about the same time. I think one was later than the other. I did not do enough research to answer this question. But okay. um, I picked 310 to Yuma. Ah, okay. A uh, well-liked movie when it came out, I believe. Yeah, 2007 received very well. I think it was like 80% Rotten Tomatoes or something like that when it came out. I have no idea yeah. if it stayed that high. The remake of a 1950s Western with uh, the remake was with Christian Bale and Russell Crowe and... Ben, Ben Foster, Ben Foster, uh, Ben Foster. Okay. Yeah. You know, he's good. You know, Ben Foster. Anyway, he's in stuff. People know. Him. Um, I think Alan Tudyk was in it too. Was he killed? He's usually killed in stuff. I believe so. Yeah. I, I'm, I can't, I didn't rewatch it before this. We, we picked the topic too late to rewatch yeah. our films, but it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. if I, if I'm remembering right, I think Alan Tudyk didn't make it. Um, the basic plot of the original and the new one, um, followed the same exact track, very simple morality story, much like any Western right. from the fifties. Um, a civil war veteran who's now a farmer gets dragged into, uh, relaying this wanted criminal to a prison train from Yuma to, uh, from somewhere to to Yuma, Arizona. So he has to make the 310 to Yuma. I can't right, remember. Right, because that's the name. At the time the train leaves, right? The time the, the train leaves train. the town, they have to make it to, to, and then it's heading to the prison in Yuma, I believe is the story. Right. Um, there's definitely a different creativity to it. It's not the same film. Um, Westerns from the 50s are just not paced the same way. In general, I think that's a that's common for movies remade in the more modern time Yeah, than uh, just like movies that were shot in the fifties and sixties. And even some cases, the seventies just are slower and a lot more yeah, paced is the, is the right word. And you know, that if you try to sell that to a modern audience, people fall asleep. True, true. And I don't mean that the, um, it's just like an action action film. It's not an action film. It's still, um, 
is very 1950s in terms of the drama. There's scenes where guys are sitting around campfires multiple times talking about just life and their, you know, internal moralities and why they do what they do and their, their pasts and sure. all that sort of stuff. It's very much still a classic Western, but, you know, revamped that the action scenes are much more um, intricate. They're much better overall. Mm-hmm. Um, the story does take a new twist at the end. I don't know if we're doing spoilers here. We probably don't need to, huh? Yeah, I, unless do you think the spoiler is particularly instructive. Like, I don't know. I, mm. I don't know. I don't think I have seen uh, this movie. So. Okay, I'm not going to spoil the ending of the original or not about whether they make the train or don't make the train. Um, the 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 characters take different paths for sure, uh, and the okay. ending is is while still very similar, uh, gives you different character arcs. I don't know if that makes sure. any sense. So, like something that I think is interesting about a, a remake in general, right? Like, what parts of the originals, like spirit of that movie, did they choose to keep, and which ones did they not? So it sounds like this one sort of tried to stay true to the plot structure somewhat, but maybe not necessarily like slavishly adhered to it, right? Yeah, it seems kind of to me when I was examining the like the good parts of this movie and um you know the other good remakes that I thought of along this track, it seemed always very requisite that it kept in the vein or spirit of the original film. And, and part of that is keeping a decent chunk of the story, right? Like if you remove, yeah, if you remove a lot of who the characters were from the original film, like say he's no longer a civil war soldier, but he's just a, you know, the um, Christian Bale's yeah. character is just a sheriff instead. It's like the, you've, you've gone into this black and white land, right? Whereas before, you know this there is a yeah. there's this north ver- union versus um versus confederacy tension and there's also this this gray area of like you know he gets opportunities to walk away from something he doesn't have to do and you you lose a lot of the spirit of something if you change sometimes the plot sometimes you gain a lot by changing the plot or in the case of television i think you can also step outside the plot or advance sure, the plot yeah. right like like this 310 to Yuma film has extra scenes in it, right? It's longer. There's more yeah. characters. So they add on and the add ons give it more. You're talking about how like they, they choose different paths. Like, it's the same characters, right? Or mostly the same characters with some additions. And then they, they don't necessarily, f- the characters don't have the same arc, right? Cause you already saw that arc, right? Like the original already did this arc for this character. Well, like what if the character made some different choices and now this arc goes like this? You know, instead of, oh, this nice perfect curve, right? Like, well, you saw that perfect curve in the original movie. What if now, you know, there's a bump along the way and it does some other stuff? It's a, I think it's a, it's good for them to like recontextualize that in, but while thinking about the characters, right? Not necessarily just like going, and what if there was a bear? Like, right, right, yeah. Like, just like, woo, fight scene. Like, you know, don't do that. Like, think about it from the character's perspective and write a script that way. Right. 310 to Yuma was the example that I picked because unlike some of the other ones, which were either extremely faithful and had exactly the same things happen with the same lines and same shot for shot, and you just thought, this is better acted or whatever, 310 to Yuma was my example of tinkering they didn't change it they tinkered on it they said this character is more conflicted this character is more outlandish this character is going to make a different decision here and it's going to change everything about how they understand each other Mm. and it's just like one quick decision changes the storyline it's not you know surprise in the middle of the movie the main character gets, you know, blown up by dynamite and everybody gets buried in rubble. And now it's a whole new ru- movie, right? Like right. that's not what happens. You yeah. Know? Cause th- like surprise, like surprises for the sake of being a surprise is silly. Right. But it's something that adds to the overall total of the plot. Right. They can be fun. And a lot of those types of things where you have these huge twists in the middle of the film b- during your remake, or you start off differently with different characters. They don't, 
I don't think they keep in the same spirit. So you're already automatically watching something different. Why didn't we do, right. why don't we do another story then, you know, with another thing. The other thing that stood out to me on this film particularly, and I don't know if you've noticed this with a lot of older films, like not, not like seventies, eighties, cause some of those are pretty good, but sixties, fifties, uh, significant improvements in music design and sound mm. design in these movies these remakes yeah. of those films change yeah. them entirely. I kind of wish that somebody could take the three tenth to Yuma soundtrack from the new one and just sit it over the old one and see if that makes that movie better. Because the nostalgia of saying like, well, three ten to Yuma was a cool movie when it came out or, you know, I wasn't alive when it came out, obviously, but sure, I, but, you know, yeah. my grandparents owned a VHS copy of it and we yeah. watched it once or twice. And I it. thought, yeah, I thought it was cool. Right. But it's not a movie that, I would go back and watch. It's not a movie that I have fond feelings for. It's not a movie that I own. It's a movie that when they said they're making a remake of it, you're like, Oh yeah. You know what? That was a cool story. Yeah. Okay. To, so for somebody to have told, like it was a good morality tale. It was a good plot. Like there's a really cool device that they have to make this train, you know? And like, yeah, that's cool. And it's a good movie to remake. And that's the feeling like that I got. That's, from yeah. thinking about when they were going to make it. And that's, I think, immediately requisite to having, like, the feeling that you're going to walk into a good remake. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. that deserves to be remade. You know, that didn't get a good shake. Like, um, Yeah, the, a movie that you dearly love and, like, hold as, like, a, a true classic that you have a lot of feelings for is not necessarily a great candidate for a remake. Yeah, but everybody has, you know, feelings for a classic, right? So I think sure. that we have to, if we're going to, maybe we just, we discuss these during the bad movie parts because this okay. is probably a better time to do it. But I think there's a con a couple concrete things we can come up with about like what makes one good versus bad. Yeah. Like, okay. I have a lot of nostalgia for, for Ghostbusters, right? Okay. It's an example. Sure. Yeah. What, what makes making a remake of Ghostbusters a bad idea more than just the fact that you and I can probably quote almost all the lines from that movie. Right. It, that doesn't help. You know, I can tell you that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's uh, I, yeah, I, I, I'll be interested to hear what your thoughts are on that. Uh, we'll put that off for a bit. Come back around, I guess. Yeah. So what was um, your good film? So my good film is a remake of a, uh, I think pretty, so, <laughs> Ignoring some of what you just said, uh, this is a remake <laughs> of a true classic, a movie that I think most people will agree was a seminal movie. So not a Western. Not a Western. Uh, it is Godzilla 2014, I guess. Uh, the title of the movie is just Godzilla. Okay, so who, which Godzilla is that one actors-wise? Is that the one with um, Breaking this, Bad? Uh, yes. It is the uh, uh, Brian Cranston uh I forget the um the main guy's name. Uh Ken Watanabe is in it. Um I really should have researched the actors in this movie. Uh I didn't do that. Whoops. Uh anyhow, uh, the, the movie came out in 2014, so relatively recent. Uh and it it is uh in some ways uh a remake of the original Godzilla movie. Uh and in a lot of ways not actually a remake. Uh it doesn't really follow the same plot as the original. Uh, it doesn't have any of the same characters, uh, except for Godzilla, the, the titular monster. But they did bring the character of that monster back in a way that that monster sort of became... The, the movie is named after the monster, right? Right. And in the original, he's kind of this, like, unstoppable force that's sort of a, you know, meant to show you, like, the demon of atomic weapons and the horror of, like, that stuff. And the revenge and, of nature, basically. Uh, right, yeah. It, it, you know, there's a pretty it's a pretty simple tale, like, you know, humans screw with nature, nature gets back, like, you know, get <laughs> people need to understand, and the planet is going get to it, get its in the end, right? Mm-hmm. It will win. <laughs> it will still be here no matter what we do to it. And so even though this movie doesn't necessarily follow the same, it introduces more monsters. Uh, there's other monsters that Godzilla fights against it still comes out with the sort of the same feeling, right? You, you, nature will adapt humans and nature can work together to overcome problems. Uh, and 
Godzilla kind of ends up being a hero by the end of the movie almost. Really? Uh, yes. Uh, and it, But it works because they reimagine, you know, the uh, you know, Godzilla is still born out of these nuclear tests uh, back in the, you know, the 50s and stuff uh, during the uh, the Second World War and the, the arms race that followed in the Cold War. So it's definitely not like a sequel or related to the other remake it of would this be, film, right? It, no, it is not. It is a complete reimagining of everything related to Godzilla. Ground up, there's never been a Godzilla before this Godzilla well, monster there, in this movie. Right. There was a Godzilla monster in the 50s, and he's just been kind of around out there, but the government's been covering it up. Oh, okay. Uh, and <laughs> then he's been destroying the world, and no one knows since no, the 50s? No, no, no. He, ha- he hasn't been destroying stuff, right? Oh. They were tr- the nukings, that, the nuke tests were an attempt to uh, destroy him then, right? But they didn't. And they, uh, they sort of just realized, okay, we can't destroy it with nukes, so we're just going to have to, like, you know, leave it alone. And it goes off, you know, and swims away off into the ocean and does its own thing. Mm-hmm. You, you sort of get all this through flashbacks from older characters that are telling the story to the younger leads and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's these new pods that were found in, like, excavation somewhere uh, that birth these, I forget the name they use for them, these other monsters, right? that feed on nuclear energy and other nuclear power, right? These kinds of like, uh, I don't remember where they said they came from, but they're like, you know, extra earth origins. They came on meteorites and whatever Mm. kind of like have infested and grown in these various places. So we're not hitting spoiler territory, right? Uh, nah, not really. Uh, the, it's more important to understand that like this movie sort of, uh, Godzilla is kind of on our side in a way. I mean, look, they still destroy the heck out of some cities, right? In both sides, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, no one is super happy about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, the, the human weapons don't really work on these other monsters and we sort of, you know, can Godzilla also fights them for the same reasons, uh, that we're fighting them, right? Because it's his planet too. Oh, interesting. So Godzilla is really like sentient kind of. Or I don't know if they imply that. Um, I don't remember it. I also didn't get to rewatch this movie. Um, but the uh, they did a great job. So the, the thing about Godzilla, right, is that the original movie was always about the monster, right? And this movie, they actually spend some time on the characters, the humans, right? Because uh, I've spent all this time, I haven't even mentioned barely that there are humans in this movie. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that this movie does well, that maybe wasn't so interesting in the original, right? And there, the original was, they reimagined part of the movie to include the humans in part of the, to include the humans in the script more or less, right? Instead of everyone just, you know, running away and there being like a very brief sort of cursory love story off the side. Now the humans are actually, you know, have agency and are a part of the plot uh, in this new movie. And, you know, they're sort of, they, there's a reason for you to care about humans in this movie, other than the fact that you are also a human and you might want to root for them. <laughs> Do you mean the they stepped past the fault of every black and white monster movie? Yes, exactly. And so they took an, a thing that was, you know, a character that's beloved, right? Like Godzilla, the monster movies, that whole classic genre, and found a way to adapt it to make a whole story out of it rather than just a one-sided kind of schlocky thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the part that I thought that was great about this movie. What's interesting about the Godzilla franchise in general, I think, is that there's never been, well, maybe just because I haven't watched all of the Japanese films, there's never let's been... let's be clear, a, there are a lot of those. Yeah. A lot. But, but I know there's like a through line of those films, but overall, Vaguely. it's just Godzilla stomping around and fighting other monsters, right? So at yes. the end of the day, there's no overarching plot or beloved yeah. characters of the humans or you know yeah. the seminal original Godzilla film doesn't have a storyline that is cohesive enough to worry about so at the end of the day they get to take a character and c- completely reimagine it rather than a story and reimagine it right yeah and so that was the thing they did here right it's it felt and they took the design of the monster and it felt very similar to that original design right they didn't redesign it a lot um, and they left that relatively alone because that character already existed, right? And they didn't mess with that part of that character. 
and then they because you know in in those other movies right godzilla eventually becomes a hero for the humans right like that's something that he you know when he fights mothra and mecha godzilla and <laughs> all those other all those other weird monsters that he fights right yeah like he is on he saves tokyo more times than he destroys it right and that's something that definitely bothered me about the godzilla american ideal or idea of godzilla is like we never had the idea that he was godzilla is a good guy understood as a, a champion of the planet even though he destroyed a lot of cities right and so the they took that part where like okay people already know this godzilla and then made the rest of the story like how does he get from that to this right like how does he go from being monster destroys tokyo to being monster that everyone in the world kind of loves but also are afraid of so uh it's like the it gives it gives Godzilla the arc that Godzilla never had, right? And like, you know, the humans help in there, which were not really a part of the original. Nice. Yeah, and there's uh, definitely some good like human uh acting and stuff in that movie this time, uh which cannot be said of another movie, Andrew. Oh, are we going to go straight into your bad one? Yeah, let's go straight into it because I feel like it's relevant here because the bad movie I'm choosing <laughs> is also Godzilla. <laughs> uh, that's why I had this A-plus oh, segue. Because, oh, uh, the one with I'm Matthew talking, Broderick, I assume? I'm talking about the 1998 remake starring Matthew Broderick and some other people, none of whom really should have been mentioned in association with this awful, awful movie. Okay, I'm going to throw out a spoiler for that terrible version. Let's go. They cliffhanger the ending of that with Godzilla eggs. That's right. <laughs> and there's a whole thing, right? Godzilla is this, like, unknowable, faceless evil that just shows up and starts destroying things because never really explains why. And, like, somehow in later in the movie, in the soccer stadium or something, you find there's, like, 300 Godzilla eggs. I don't know. It's like It's like if Cloverfield tried to have more of a plot. Not even like Cloverfield <laughs> has a plot. You just have to like, you know, think about it. Yeah. Like this is just like, what if we have Godzilla destroy famous landmarks in New York? Okay. What's the rest of the movie? I don't know. Have Matthew Broderick shoot at it or something. I don't know. Whatever. Get a woman in there. Isn't he All like right. a scientist kind of, but also just kind of. Yeah. He's like a scientist that was like it. marooned in Jamaica or something. And he's, yeah, it's dumb. It's awful. And it's it's awful precisely for the reason the monster was completely redesigned during development, right? It doesn't look anything like what you think the classic Godzilla look looks like, right? Godzilla kind of looks like a weird dinosaur with like like a T-Rex arms and a giant tail. This Godzilla looks like a slimy, like hunched over T-Rex, but a giant head and like weird arms and like a fish. Anyway, it's a weird looking monster. I would tell you to Google it, but don't. It's not worth it. And then they just made it like this, like, it's destroying stuff because uh, cause we spent all our special effects budget on it, destroying Madison Square Garden and also, I guess, like, the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to do this now, and uh, let's write a script around that. And, and, like, the characters have no arc and make decisions that make very little sense. And, and they, they didn't, you know, the, the characters are there you know, in sort of to be the foil of the evil monster. But the evil monster is just there because, like, they don't have... It just shows up for... I don't know. I never understood why. It just shows up. Like, they don't give you a good reason for it coming to the city to destroy stuff. Man. But I guess because Matthew Broderick is there? I don't know. Like the, I remember them putting this on TV all the time. And then at the end, like, it's worth spoiling this just because it's so dumb. You know, they, they break into the... Um, the stadium and find a bunch of eggs and they destroy them all and Godzilla comes back and eventually they kill it or wound it or whatever and like it dies on the bridge or falls off the bridge into the ocean and is dead or whatever and then like the movie ends and you see there was one egg they missed and a little Godzilla comes out and roars and that's the end of the movie what it made like yeah no sense like they were there shooting did they just forget to shoot that one like <laughs> I don't, yeah, awful terrible and like none of the the fun, uh, none of the, you know, like no no morality there, right? Godzilla is just bad. The humans are just good 
because like the humans don't have interesting arcs, right? Like yeah, they don't no really have anything to there do about though. atomic energy. They're just there to stop the monster because it's rampaging in New York. Like, okay, I mean, that's a good you probably don't want the monster rampaging in New York, but like they don't have any connection to it. They're just there. Yeah, it definitely feels like they're just sort of thrown into a plot that's not even a plot, right? It's just kind of Yeah. It's like a lot of people yell things and are like, this is, he's doing it because of this or like this. And it's like, I'm giving you exposition in the middle of this action scene. Like, okay, this is just stop. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, and to top it all off, since it's late nineties, the CG isn't very good. And the monster does a lot of like contortionist things to fit into places where maybe like it, it seems like they didn't do the thing that good movies do where they like have a scale for the monster and it stays consistent. Right. Like it, <laughs> so you, you can find smaller. Well, as like, Oh, it has to escape through the sewers here. Well, like sewers aren't necessarily that big. Like, right. Like, yeah, there are parts of them where they're big, but like not all sewers are gigantic. And so this giant monster can like swim around through the sewers and like, it, I, how like, <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, something big enough to destroy the Brooklyn Bridge is now swimming through even the subway in New York or something. Yeah, like, and it's like, it's and if it's swimming through the subway, right? Like, subway isn't filled with water, dude. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's a lot of it's stuff that doesn't make a lot of sense, and and then they don't even try to explain it. They're just like, it can do this, obviously. Like, we need it to be in this other part of town now, so it's got there by the subway. Done. (laughs) Like, okay, sure. Yeah, it's just lazy. acquisition of a property and then you have to make a film that's it one of those yeah. one of those instances where they just very clearly were like well we've got this property we need to try and get some money off of it and it was advertised a lot let me go ahead and tell you i remember when this movie came out it was all over the place at the time they it was on you know drink cups and you know tv and ads and magazines and newspapers and all over the place and i think this movie did very badly <laughs> oh i wouldn't be surprised at all it's probably so it's probably that, one of the worst films uh in that genre ever for sure yeah yeah I, and i won't claim to be a like big fan of monster movies or anything or even have seen even a majority of the godzilla films but that i can say is probably the worst one don't see it. <laughs> uh, I did not pick a monster movie for my bad movie. All right. I'm happy to switch it up. I picked one with an actor that I genuinely enjoy a lot of his films. Not every single one. There's been okay. a few misses. Um, but he's enjoyable to watch on the screen. JJ, if I if I said it's a Jackie Chan movie, what would you say? Oh, I like Jackie Chan. What's he's in stuff? What's maybe the worst film he's been in in recent memory? Oh, it's a recent movie. Mm. Gosh, I haven't seen a lot of his recent movies. That probably tells you something. The Karate Kid. Oh, ouch! Again, on an airplane, sometimes your iPad battery runs out, and they have films. And, like, I will say that I have been on airplanes and forced to watch movies. And oftentimes they have movies that are not that bad. Well, part of my brain said, you know, maybe it can't be that bad. So let's be clear. uh, Which, when was this movie made? Do you remember the year? Because I think this movie has been remade more than once. I want to make sure we're calling out the one you're talking about. The Karate Kid has not been remade more than once. Didn't they do one with a girl? There are four Karate Kid movies. (laughs) Okay. Previous to remaking this in 2010. And you're right. There is a girl. There was one with a girl. It was not a remake. It was a sequel. Which the girl is Hilary Swank, by the way. Uh, Didn't didn't see it. But Mr. Miyagi was in all of those. Okay. So not a remake until we have now replaced Mr. Miyagi. Right. Marita. Marita's in all all four of those. And now we've replaced Mr. Miyagi with Jackie Chan, which I mean, on its face. On the surface. Yeah. uh, That, if you just, if the elevator pitch was, let's remake the Karate Kid, but Pat Marita is dead. So let's use Jackie Chan instead. I would have been like, yeah, okay. Okay. 
Like, that seems like an elevator pitch I could get behind. Except instead, let's, you know, let's change it up even more than that. And then we'll okay. also... I mean, it's good to do new stuff. Instead of it being karate, because that's Japanese, it'll be something else, but we'll still call it karate. Instead of being in Los Angeles, we're going to go to Beijing. So it's going to be in China now. Okay, yeah, yeah. well, like, you, you make a lot by shooting movies in China. Sure. A lot of Chinese audiences get behind them and stuff. That makes sense. Right, right, right. So we'll, you know, we'll do it in China. We'll still call it Karate Kids so for American audiences. We'll have Jackie Chan. So you'd be like, oh, okay, cool. So it's about, like, you know, a Chinese youth trying to fit in when he moves from Shanghai to Beijing or something, right? Okay, S- same story. No, nah, let's just take an American. Wait, why is he in China? And then dump them in Beijing. Oh, no. And have him feel like, oh, I can't fit in, so I'm going to go learn karate or something. That's... From a wait, Chinese man. That's Andrew. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> They've made some big mistakes. <laughs> this is what we talked about earlier with 310 to Yuma. Tinker. Right. Don't start from a different place. Tinker along the way. And so the the soul of the original Karate Kid movie, right? I mean, they Jean-Claude Van Damme the shit out of that and ripped it right out of his chest. <laughs> the soul is just gone. Pat Morita is spinning in his grave. Temple of Doom, like, yeah. ripping the heart out right to oh the chest. Oh, my God. So follow follow the original film and, you know, like, say, think, about, uh, think about the track movie, of the right? original film. Not two and three, right? Because four is kind of like a remake with Hilary Swank being the new kid and she doesn't fit in and blah, blah, blah. But two right. and three are like sequels where Ralph Macchio's now, you know, like this uber karate star or whatever. Yeah. The, it, the, the original movie... Yeah. So, like, the what's the what's the feeling you get from the original movie? What is it about to you when you think about the Karate it's Kid? The that movie is the the kid, right, having this like crisis of self confidence and overcoming that through the help of his teacher, teaching him to rise, you know, above this like peer pressure and stuff, and become, you know, find something that he is interested in and like get into that. And like allows him finds him that he's good at that he can beat the the people that were tormenting him. He's also right. He's a he's an outsider in a way. He comes from from right. New, New Jersey or New York. I can't remember. Yeah, I forget. He moves to the new town, right? He moves to the new town. Yeah, he moves to Los Angeles from from the East Coast. He's got an accent. He kind of sticks out a little bit. He's not not confident in himself, but he doesn't fit in. And that right, that the outcast. Right, he's outcast from his from this group, and he does have crisis of confidence when he can't stand up for himself because, as you know, these other karate people are are faster than him, they're stronger than him, and when he tries to exert his self confidence and do the right things, he gets beaten for it. Right, right. They took that idea and they said, okay, well, we'll have him move even further into a new culture, and so then like. He'll be an outcast there. Yeah, yeah, he'll be outcast. It's like, no, there's there's being an, a cultural outcast and there's being a non like a like a physical outcast, right? Right. It, it, they discriminate against Machio's character because he sounds different, he acts different. It's not that he is different. Right, right? he isn't different, right? If you go to Beijing, you're different. You come from a different culture. You're going to stick out. And, and while that story may yeah. be good of saying, you know, if you do martial arts, you'll fit in. It becomes a story of assimilation, not a story of like confidence building and. And eventually like, you know, getting accepted right at the end, like where, yeah. you, you know, they show the, the Cobra Kai people, oh, spoilers for Karate Kid, I guess. But like it, it, they show Cobra Kai you know, is defeated in the end. And the the people that are shown to only care about winning learn that you can do other things too. And like, you know, they, I don't know that they become friends at the end of that movie, but like, you know, the, the, you know, the power of the friendship has sort of overthrown the mentality of only caring about victory. Right. Right. And whereas you can't really use that in this case, right. They're, they're still not going to be friends with him. He still is from a different culture. than them. Right. Right. I think this is our film that's really easy to say it's beloved, right? I love the original Karate Kid. Oh yeah, it's a yeah, it's great. It's a classic for sure. 
a modern classic. Pat Morita obviously is an amazing actor in it. Ralph Macchio, he does a good job. It's not like it's overly well acted. He does acted. the job that's needed. Yeah, right? it's not like it's overly well acted or anything like that. But You didn't win any Academy Awards. Right. And the new one's not badly acted. Smith's kid does a good job. Jackie Chan does a good job. It's not like outlandishly bad. It's just badly paced with no sense of soul to it. It's like a clear cut remake for money and adjusting the story before you even begin to try and like pay square peg round hole these new characters into an old story. They took the idea. They tried to do a paint by numbers, right? And in a lot of cases, you can't just do a paint by numbers remake of something else, right? Like, okay, well this, this script had a, B and C let's just do something with a, B and C and we get the same result, right? Like, right. No, right. That's, that's not how it works. Right. So, so like you were saying earlier, Oh, it's a cultural touchstone. You can't remake it. I think that karate kid could have been remade pretty easily. Definitely. Um, definitely. There's nothing that stands out to me. You know, there's no music in that film that stands out to me that is just so iconic that if they redid it, they'd have to use it, right? There's no, mm-hmm. there's no, it's not too young. Like, it's something that bothers me sometimes is, you know, like five years ago or a year ago or whatever, you know, like when Japan made The Grudge and then we were like, yeah. that Grudge movie was really popular. We should make an American The Grudge the year later. Or- I think the the ones that really bother me are, I, I think specifically The Ring. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Yep. I think uh, where they made it in Japan, and then like not even a year later, they oh, had the an grudge. American version. Oh, it oh the Grudge is the Ring. No, it's called the Grudge. That's the one that was made a year later. Okay, I, maybe I'm com- maybe I'm compressing the timeline because there's a Japanese version of that movie called Ringu. Oh, right? okay. And it came out before. I don't know. Maybe it was farther a longer timeline. Maybe I'm compressing it in my mind, okay. but like they just did the same thing, yeah. but they just recast an American actor okay. and American actors and then just did the same story. Right. But it's like less terrifying. Well, they did exactly the same thing in the grudge and it was literally less than a year between the grudge, Japan and the grudge America. Yeah. So if they did the ring, then it was probably a little bit longer. Yeah, it, maybe this was the ring was the first time I noticed it, and then they just did it again. But but they do it on all sorts of other movies too, and it really is like, what? Why? Like uh, Spider Man. Let's take Spider Man for example, right? How many times okay. have we rebooted Spider Man since you've been Please alive? Stop! Stop! Marvel! Stop! 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 Sony. Okay, I don't. Anyone, whoever, I don't care. Stop. I have seen. So how many? Like how? Uh, Toby. Uh, the the first guy right Toby uh, Toby Maguire mm-hmm. is that his name sure uh, then there was that was the the first one that was just called Spider Man uh, then there was the was it in the the Incredible Spider Man or the Amazing Spider Man Amazing Spider Man or... and then no one liked that one I think right uh, no I think the Amazing Spider Man one got good reviews and then Amazing Spider Man two that. did not get good was reviews very bad and so they stopped again. Mm-hmm. And then they remade it again? Yeah, they're remaking it again now with Spider-Man Homecoming and Homecoming 2. And then yeah. after Homecoming but, 2, I think they've basically already said that it's not going to go any further and that they're going to reboot it again because they want it not related to Marvel Studios again. And so the right so at least the Spider-Man Homecoming, like you kind of get an introduction to the Spider-Man character in some of those other Marvel movies, right? He shows up, spoiler for whichever one that is. Avengers 2, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it, so you get a little introduction to that character. Or uh, maybe it was Civil War. Civil War had him show up, yeah. Yeah, it was Civil War. And then he, sh- um, then, so then now he's going to go do his own movie uh, and then, you know, in theory, come back or not or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's just like the – how many times have we seen that Spider-Man story? Look, Uncle Ben dies. That's not uh, including the times that Spider-Man were made before we were alive, by the way. Yes, and there's more of those. And it's just like, stop. You can remake the movie as many times as you want, and maybe they're all good. The story is a good story, right? Yeah, this is the thing that I've been actually saying about Spider-Man for a long time, is that like Spider-Man, for some reason, has gotten this canonical, you can't start any other way. Obviously, it's integral to the character that Uncle Ben die, 
and that he's bitten by a radioactive spider. Blah and blah blah blah. Great blah. power, great responsibility, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Like, Everybody gets that, the problem is that that's Spider Man, and his start is so it's it's ironclad. You can't change it, and you start and from that same place. Character. And he can't. The character can't change. Right, and, and they don't. There's no arc to him. Right, the arc is going from not being a guy to being Spider Man. That's the arc. You don't get a chance to see him go from being Spider-Man to being a different kind of Spider-Man because while those arcs exist in the comics or like, you know, he becomes Venom in the comics or he, you know, does, a, a, you know, a lot, learns something about himself. Those arcs aren't the one that has been done 57 times and proven to be popular, right? Mm-hmm. And so the public perception of Spider-Man is this guy he gets bitten by a spider. He becomes the superhero in the end and saves Whichever girlfriend at the time. Which is kind of why I'm glad they're doing this spin-off Venom movie separate from Spider-Man. Because it allows them to make an arc. It allows them like to make a Venom good movie something. with a good character from the Spider-Man universe and maybe put Spider-Man in it. Right. And that's been the problem with Venom specifically is that Venom is actually, like in the comics anyway, a good character, right? Like there's – Venom has a bunch of arcs. There's a lot of cool stuff that Venom does. But you don't get to see it because he's tied up behind Spider-Man, and all they do with Spider-Man is keep telling you the origin story over and over. Right. So, I think we got a little off topic. We got a little off track. Um, but it, the, so, like, Karate Kid could stand up to a remake that was worth it. Uh, so, I, it, but it's a cultural movie, right? Like, it's something that right. I think about, and I could, I could quote a lot of the lines. I could watch it if it was on. I could, you know what I mean? So. I mean, everyone knows Wax On, Wax Off. Right, exactly. And even if Wax On, Wax Off didn't make it to the next movie, I wouldn't be upset. Sure. I mean, the joke, you could just throw that line in as like he goes by a car wash and sees a guy doing the thing. Like, that's all you would need to do, right? You don't have to have him do that exact thing, right? Like, you know, inheriting the soul of a movie doesn't require you to like, you know, adhere to, you know, like you said, every plot point or every thing right the tinkering just has to be done in a i don't know if it needs to be an intelligent way but a like a an intentional way right so kind of i feel like karate kid while cultural is not like fabric right it's quotable but it's not Mm -hmm. like it's joke quotable, you know, wax on, whack off, wax off, sweep the leg. All that stuff is yeah. joke quotable. It's not right. f- like fabric. So I, when I kind of look at a movie like Ghostbusters instead, I haven't actually seen the remake of that and I can't say whether it's good or bad. But I and could let's be clear. I haven't either. But I could tell you that it was never going to get good reception. Right. Even if they'd cast all men. I'm not talking about the cast. None of it. I'm literally talking about physically making a movie that's a reboot of something rather than saying a sequel or whatever, like trying to start over. There's an interesting thing where like a movie that is so close to a cultural touchstone like Ghostbusters was for people of a certain age. Right. Right. It'd be like trying to remake The Breakfast Club or like. Yeah, exactly. Certain movies that just like are so emblematic of a place and a time and like those actors in that script. Yeah. And then like trying to do that again, you know, like the trying to catch lightning in a bottle effect. If you caught it in a bottle the first time, don't try to do it again. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned, um, breakfast club because it's kind of like Ferris Bueller's day off. Right. Right. Again, another movie they should not absolutely not attempt to remake. It's young enough. That the actors are still out there, right? A little, and that's not necessarily eh, the the thing. Yeah. But it's still young enough that uh, the actors are still out there, which means the in f- the people that have experienced that film in the lightning in a bottle moment are still right. around. Right. It's cultural like, fabric in a way, right? It's it's more. It's not joking when you when you say something like you know, like Bueller, right? It's like you, right. You're making a reference, like. In a meeting, you could say, does anybody know the answer to this? And then nobody answers. You say Bueller. It's kind of funny, but it's also not a joke. It's a, it's a literal phrase that means so no one knows what I'm saying. Yeah. Like no one is here yeah. that gets this? Okay. Yeah. And frankly, 
they're good films. Like they're set, they're, they're solid and tinkering on top of them may not work. Right. Like when you look at the karate kid, you could start in the same place a, a lot less removed than it was. You could start in the same place and then tinker, right? Maybe mm-hmm. Ralph Macchio's character, you know, he goes too far in the film, right? He punches that kid in the nose and breaks his nose or right. whatever. What if his character doesn't come back and we go a different route? And, you know, like... Yeah, what if he has to, you know, build up the courage to to learn to fight back. Yeah. Right? Or if he's a, be a, it would be a different story. Right. Right. Let's say he's a different character from the beginning and he's, he's not uber confident in himself. He comes, he wasn't a cool kid back in Brooklyn or right, wherever he exactly. was from. Right? So, so there's tinkering that can happen there. Whereas watch ghostbusters, watch breakfast club, watch Ferris Bueller. And like, I know we just picked all movies from the eighties and like of a certain time frame. And that's just be that's just you and I, right? right? Like it's not that there aren't other movies like these from other time periods. And it's not that it's impossible to do something like that, right? Like we're not saying that no one should try. Look, if you want to be inventive and you want to make your art, you know, go ahead. But sure. if they're trying to create commercially successful movies and you're you're looking at a movie that was this kind of like phenomenon or a lightning in a bottle kind of situation the first time. How do you go back and recapture that while also paying homage to it, right? Like you have to do the same process again while also adhering to the people that love that original. And that's just really hard to do. I mean, remakes in general run into that problem, right. but especially when you go back to these like touchstone kind of right, movies. which is why maybe it's easier when you take something from the 50s or see, you know, that's older because the less people remember sure. it. But at the same time, their spirit is more easily captured, I think, because the stories are not simpler. There are very definitely complicated stories from from older years, but their right, stories yeah. are are easier to grasp at and to tinker on top of and to not lose the spirit of them. Whereas this is what mm-hmm. kind of I was saying earlier with like music and sound design and all these other things have now piled on top of a feeling of these of these films, and you. Right. You are harder. It's harder and harder to grasp the spirit of it and then remove it and put it in something new. And so you almost, I think that if you're going to do something like, you know, let's say remake, um, what was a good movie from last year that you really liked? Um, I haven't seen a lot of like new movies, uh, that, that straight out of Compton movie. I don't. That was good. <laughs> okay, it was good. I, you know, I understand, but that doesn't help my example. Okay, sorry. But you know what? It did get me to. What you can remake Friday. Yeah, you could. You definitely. That is, that's a heavy cultural touchstone, right? Certainly. Yeah, definitely. Easy for people of a certain age. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can quote all sorts of stuff from that movie. It was on TV all the time. I got a copy mm-hmm. of it so I could watch it uncensored. And so you could actually hear the right. lines and see the movie that was half cut out for TV. The music in it <laughs> is a very, very tied to the feeling of the film. You know, there's like a totally there's a a bunch of cultural moments in it that are very '90s and Compton. Mm-hmm. That can be, I think, remade, right? And just like Ghostbusters could, but it can't just be remade. It can't be the right. same Friday movie. It has to understand to do something. the spirit of what it was and do something else, somewhere else. It, the thing that I think is interesting about the idea of bringing these older movies, right? So, like, the more modern a movie you choose, the harder it becomes to recontextualize it in an, in the modern sense, right? Like, right, because it wasn't that old, right? Like, the, the, the times haven't changed that no, much, you, but we're like... You know, 310 to Yuma, right? Like, the stories were a certain way because that's how things were at that time. Well, then there was 50 years of filmmaking. Yeah. (laughs) And, like, culture and stuff that happened in between. And so taking the, like, idea of this story and bringing it forward, it's a lot lot changes just because you and I are the ones making it rather than people from 50 years ago, right? And so just the process of that discussion already puts you on a better footing for a – quote remake or something. I, think. I really like the point you just made though, that like 
something from the eighties is not that culturally, culturally different. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different phrases and music and all that, but, but the core principles of who we were, where we are, they're still around. They're still the same. We still see those right. issues in the world and like removing the context of them. Oh, well, we'll, we'll just, we'll paint by numbers, like you said, and, and move it over so that people know it's the same story and it feels exactly the same, but it's got a new context. It's like, no, 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 no. You yeah. don't understand the yeah, you can't do that. spirit of what that was to move it somewhere else. Because if you understood the spirit of it, you wouldn't have a you kid from America to going to Beijing to learn from Jack. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. That's not exactly. grasping the spirit of it. That you know, you misunderstood yeah. what the movie was really about. You know, yeah. just redoing and, Friday in Watts instead of Compton with you know is not. not gonna, yeah, that's not the spirit. Yeah, of it's it. not going to get you the movie you want, right? Like, but you know, redoing it in a modern sense, like okay, well maybe it happens in Detroit, and maybe. There's like, you know, problems with the water and like, you know, like all these things, you know, current events and other stuff that have been happening, like bring that into the movie. And how does that affect what arc these characters would go on? Right. Like that could be a good remake. It's just, you know, it's a case of, uh, you know, how much time and, you know, effort and money do the people want to, and not everyone works hard. I'm not saying people don't put effort into it, but the, the, the thought it's it's hard right like you you can't just you know like we were saying paint by numbers to create a good remake you have to really you know start off with a certain kind of source material and you know want to create something different yet similar i think we hit pretty much a perfect definition right there at the end of how to understand where you're headed with a remake and what we yeah. like. And I think that in the future, if we need to do another on the drive episode, we should pick some more films and talk about what they hit and what they miss in the context. We just discussed, man. Yeah. I think that would be really fun. All right. Well, this is the end of on the drive part one. Then, uh, if people want us to talk about some remakes, I think that we could definitely take some suggestions or, uh, yeah, you know please. what else we're going to get JJ. We're going to get some hate yeah. mail about Spider-Man. And I think most eh. people who are going to send us hate mail about Spider-Man already know where to send it. But where would people need to send us some remakes? If they want to send us some uh, some films to talk about, they can send them to podcast at wewergamers.com. That's an email address. Send email there. Uh, if you want to get at us on the social media where we also read uh, the things that you post, uh, you could go to facebook.com slash wewergamers like that page follow us on there uh we're on twitter at we were gamers uh, our instagram is also we were gamers if you want to follow us on all those social platforms uh we will read your comments <laughs> in the order that we like them <laughs> <laughs> all right man well uh hopefully there's a good quick soon use for this episode and i'll see you next week 